facilitator. Um, today we're having a session specifically about COVID-19 and the issue of masks, about whether to wear them or not, or who should be, of what kind. Um, and we have a great panelist, panel of experts today with Dr. DeLucia, Dr. Files, Zarconi, and Dr. Smith. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. DeLucia first. Please go ahead and introduce yourself um, at that time and then as each of you speak. Throughout the session, please note that you can put any questions in the chat box and we will get to the questions after the presentation. If you're calling in on the phone and have a problem with using the chat box, you can also put, submit your questions to neomedecho at neomed.edu. We ask that everybody stay muted unless called on otherwise. Um, you can use star six to mute yourself if you somehow become unmuted. And we do offer continuing medical education and continuing education credits for counselors and social workers today. Um, so the EADS code for that is 90 SOS, S E W S. And you'll go to EADS.com, which we will put the information into the chat box, and you'll have some information in the follow up email too. But in the meantime, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited that we have Dr. Delusha File and Zarconi back with us. Um, we're not regulars to this. Friday Echo program. I'm going to hand it to you, Dr. DeLucia. Okay, thanks, Nicole. My name is uh, um, Angelo DeLucia. I'm professor of molecular virology at Neomed, and I'm also the course director for the medical student class in microbiology immunology, and I've been teaching about viruses and also working on them for quite some time. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes before I unleash and uh, let uh, Dr. File talk about the various masks that are uh, being used or contemplating being used. So the history is that, very briefly, the history is that the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, originally advised masks would be unnecessary for healthy people. Um, the, the, these previous guidelines were rooted in the need to save valuable masks for health professionals uh, in view of, the, if, of, a, of a shortage, which is a real shortage. Uh, it really exists, uh, the shortage does exist. So, uh, but however, um, new research notes that people without symptoms can in fact transmit the virus and masks can reduce the amount, there's research that indicates that masks can actually reduce the amount of viral particles released from these individuals. And even newer information that indicates that wearing a mask can actually prevent, potentially prevent the infection uh, to uninfect infected people from those that are infected. And in all, and most of this research has to do with droplet size and, and uh, 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 aerosol, ballistic, aerosol um, uh, uh, time of aerosols in the atmosphere, which depends on uh, heat, humidity, uh, temperature, um, um, uh, basically heat and, and humidity. To, um, so, uh, but much of that is, uh, is done, has been done by aerosol chemists and, and other people interested in this problem. And so from that data, we are, we are getting information that is actually um, scientifically based versus the, the recommendation that was originated in the beginning of this uh, a pandemic. Uh, I, I, we can get into that if people have questions, but uh, right now I'd just like to uh, um, uh, let Dr. File introduce himself and then have a uh, discussion about the masks themselves. Well, thanks, uh, Angelo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, again and discuss this uh, issue. I mean, when we sort of considered discussing this maybe 10 days ago, 11 days ago, it was before the CDC changed their guidance. It was much more, I think, of a controversial issue then uh, than maybe it is now. Uh, but it was really um, interesting for us uh, here at SUMA because it was about that time, actually about two weeks ago, actually two weeks ago today, when we started to consider, let's go ahead and adopt a universal masking policy for all of our employees. Uh, and, and we did that for several reasons. Uh, number one, we wanted to uh, prevent potential spread amongst our workforce because of what Dr. Galusha said, we do know that there is a significant percentage of patients who are infected with this. You don't know exactly, but I mean, some of the projections are up to 50%, um, and that they can transmit even if they're not sick. So our whole concept of the six foot rule 
was based on these air droplets that when you cough and when you sneeze, that's how far these droplets would uh, trans go into the air. And then if you were within that uh, distance, you would be ex exposed to them. But now it does appear that even when we're talking actually, uh, that there's a little bit of uh, air transmission, which probably doesn't go uh, five to six feet, but yet still could be uh, transmitting this virus to others. Now, I just wanna show you that, so now it, it, our policy is that everybody that comes into the hospital has to wear a mask. Now, what I'm wearing now is a, is a cloth mask. It's a uh, handmade mask. And this is what basically we're using, using for everybody that comes to the hospital that does not have direct patient care. Um, and so I'm just gonna take this off right now uh, just to show you the various masks that we use based on um, um, patient care. Actually, um, since I'm in my office now and the office is closed and there's nobody in my office with me, it's safe for me not to have the mask, but I just wanted to start out uh, you know, showing uh, the mask that I'm using. So this is a, uh, it's a cloth, handmade mask. The filtration, is what's well, better than not wearing a mask, but it's not really well uh, studied. Uh, but studies have been done in various uh, sort of conditions like influenza to show that it does have some benefit uh, when a population wears the mask. And, and like uh, Dr. Lucha said, it's probably not because uh, it's preventing me from getting influenza or a virus infection from somebody else. It, it's more because it's uh, uh, a barrier against my breathing or coughing or whatever. So I'm probably protecting other people. But when a high percentage of the population all wear them, that's going to re reduce uh, transmission. Now, I want to show you the other type of mask that we use. This is the regular standard surgical mask. I used this earlier. You're really only supposed to use this once and after you take it off, you're supposed to discard it. But I'm only using it here for illustration. But this is a, a more definitive uh, material. It's, it's either cotton or some uh, uh, fabric or non-woven fabric, but it does actually, it, it's more efficient in preventing um, <clears throat> uh, uh, airborne uh, particles from going out of me. And it's particularly designed for that because it's really what surgeons use so that they're, when they're looking over the surgical field, which could be one foot, uh, the nurses, the uh, OR techs, et cetera, you know, they're not going to be breathing potential germs into the surgical field. So that's what it's designed for. It's not designed necessarily to prevent infection in me because it's loosely fitting. So if there's airborne particles, it can go around the mask, et cetera, et cetera. So that's this. Now, when I'm evaluating a patient like I was earlier today, literally an hour ago, in our COVID units, we wear a mask, and you've all heard about these, the N95s, and I think that's what Dr. Delucci is wearing there. It's a different format uh, than what I have, but this is an N95 as well, but it's the, the important part, it's thicker, it's much more efficient as a filter, but what's important, and as Dr. Delucci is showing you, it seals all around the mask. So uh, you know, when I put it on, um, I have to really push it in around the nose, make sure it's tightly fitted all around. There's a tight seal all around. So literally, um, air cannot get in. So this really does protect me uh, from airborne particles that are within an area that I might breathe in. I have to tell you, though, when you uh, wear this, it is very tight fitting. It's really somewhat difficult to breathe in and out when you've got it on for a whole time. I can tell you just from my personal experience, if I've had this on for a half hour, I really get quite uncomfortable. It, you really have to breathe harder than normally you do to uh, uh, get your oxygen, et cetera. Now, I wanna show you, now, the other thing that we're concerned about, and I'm sure you heard about this as well, is that it's not just the mouth and the nose. I mean, if the, um, if the virus gets close to our eyes, uh, we can um, be exposed as well. So whenever we go to see a patient who is COVID positive or we're, we're concerned about COVID, we either wear goggles like this, and I'm showing you that, or we can sh wear what's called a, a, a face guard that actually has the goggle, goggles and it covers the, the mouth and the nose as well. Now this actually is not a true filter, so we would still wear our 95 mask under it. I don't know if 
can, can you see it here? I think, can you see it, uh, Angelo, what I'm looking at, what I'm showing? Yeah, okay. And then um, when, if we're in a patient's room and there's gonna be a uh, procedure that may aerosolize the virus, uh, such as uh, if we do a bronchoscopy or something, then, and I don't have it with me, but we use what's called a PAPR. And that's, that, that refers to a powered air purifying respirator, which is- Can you lift that up a little bit, Tom? Just Can, can you read it, see it? Can you see it, uh, Angela? Well, anyway, um, I don't know, is, is this visible? <laughs> yeah, we can see it good. Yes. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So, I mean, it completely covers the whole head face, neck, and I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there is a uh, hose back here that connects with a, a machine. So the, the air is purified, uh, it's filtered. So uh, this is completely uh, to protect anybody if there's aerosolized uh, particles uh, within the room. So I just wanted to show you uh, that as well. Now, after we um, you know, use these goggles, I mean, we're gonna wipe them off with uh, uh, hand sanitizer, or at least sanitizing uh, wipes. Uh, we do that with the phones and everything else. With my keyboards, I wipe the um, keyboard as well because we're also concerned about surface uh, contamination and transmission uh, that way. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you those examples of what we use, the various uh, sort of higher efficient uh, masks and barriers, particularly where we're, uh, with a patient, where, you know, when I'm within five to six foot of a patient, then I have to use a, a 95 or an N95 uh, mask. But as uh, Angela already said, I mean, uh, previously it was recommended by public health that healthy people wearing a mask would not help them uh, because, uh, well, number one, unless you uh, actually wore an N95 mask, but uh, he also said that we did not ever recommend the public wear an N95 mask because we need them in the healthcare system and there is a shortage of supply. So we, it's important that we have them for us when we see uh, the people. Uh, it was recommended that when we would have patients with uh, COVID-19 and that we would send them home, we would give them some efficient masks so that if they were around people, uh, they could wear a, a mask or we, their caregivers, we would give them an efficient mask because we didn't, we wanted to protect them. Uh, we do know that the masks that we use uh, that are not uh, N95s, once you use them, we have to discard them or if they become moist or if they become dirty, uh, we have to discard them um, because then they no longer are as, uh, as, as efficient. And, and one of the concerns that the health, uh, public health had about the public wearing masks um, before they actually changed their guidance, that is CDC, was that number one, masks potentially could trap in uh, viruses that will, that could that potentially worsen the situation? But more importantly, they were concerned that it would give a false sense of security, uh, that it might reduce a more important uh, procedure or, or process that it's important for us to reduce the spread, and that is social or physical distancing. Uh, because we all know that if we're more than six feet away from other per uh, other person, we're gonna significantly reduce the, uh, the, the likelihood of transmission. And so the thought was, well, people might not adhere to that as much as to social distancing if they have a mask on, thinking that the mask is gonna protect them. And that really we didn't want uh, to occur. But as uh, Dr. DeLucia already said, uh, we now know that there's a relatively high rate of uh, uh, infection associated with uh, asymptomatic uh, persons or pre-symptomatic persons that are walking around and talking like I am and potentially shedding it. So if I'm talking to somebody who's three or four foot away, potentially I could transmit it uh, to them. So the thought was then, well, if that's the case, and this is a lot different than the other novel coronaviruses like SARS and MERS that I'll get to in a second, because we didn't see that with them. We didn't see asymptomatic shedding. Um, but if that's the case, if we put some barrier, even a cloth mask, that that is potentially gonna reduce spread. And that has been shown in influenza outbreaks uh, that that does have some uh, potential uh, benefit, mainly because of what we both have said, because if, if a high population is using them, then those people who are asymptomatic 
if they're using them, are not going to spread it uh, to other people. So we all know, we almost now have to consider that anybody is infected, even if they're uh, not sick. Uh, and so if that's the case, if everybody who is not sick wears a mask, we're going to reduce uh, the transmission. Now, as I said, two weeks ago, we made the decision that we were going to do this because we wanted to protect our workforce as much as possible, realizing that the primary benefit is if, if all of our care workers wear the mask, they're not going to give it to their, uh, um, their co-workers when they're working with them because they're in close proximity. They're not going to give it to the patient, so that's important. Uh, but there probably is some benefit to protect them as well. And I can tell you that when we went to this, um, the healthcare providers felt an increased sense of comfort um, that they probably were somewhat less likely to acquire uh, the virus in the healthcare setting as well. So that was quite helpful. And then, of course, last Friday, the CDC issued their new guidance uh, to go ahead and indicate that everybody, when you're in the public and potentially going to be around people, when you go out to the grocery store, if you go to the pharmacy or whatever, uh, you should uh, wear the mask. And it could just be the cloth mask because, again, the purpose is just to have some type of barrier to prevent these um, uh, air droplets from spreading out uh, from yourself when you even talk or cough. Now, I wanted to bring up a, a difference of this novel vi virus, uh, the coronavirus 19, uh, SARS 2, with SARS, because SARS was uh, 20 years ago, and, and maybe Dr. Zarconi remembers that I was actually in China when SARS was identified by the World Health Organization. I was actually in Hong Kong at the time. And, and ironically, I was over there giving um, some, um, uh, some lectures on pneumonia. Uh, and then at the time, they had this outbreak of a unusual pneumonia, particularly in a specific province, Guangdong province. I was actually supposed to go there. Uh, I didn't because they canceled it because they knew about this outbreak. But um, I literally saw, as soon as the World Health Organization announced this, and it was on, I think, March 15th of uh, 2003 uh, that the city, Hong Kong, which is very vibrant, everybody's on the streets, it's very densely populated, as you know, and all of a sudden became nobody in the streets and everybody was wearing masks. But what was very different about the uh, sort of the epidemiology of that particular infection, SARS, which is a novel coronavirus, and it's genetically very similar to this, is that there did not appear to be any asymptomatic infection. And when people uh, did not appear to transmit, even during the incubation period, they uh, traditionally did not transmit until they were sick, and usually towards the end of their illness. And so that's why it's very interesting, because if you look at the epidemiology of SARS 20 years ago, the higher risk people of acquiring the infection were healthcare workers, not family members. Because by the time they got sick and went into the hospital, that's when they started shedding more virus than they were at home uh, with their family members. But also because of that, it allowed the uh, SARS uh, outbreak, which really never became a significant pandemic, although it did spread to some other countries. And you may recall that there was an outbreak in Toronto of, uh, that, that occurred because of people who, who traveled from uh, Hong Kong and China. But, um, because there was no asymptomatic shedding or pre-symptomatic shedding, if you identified patients who were sick and you quarantined them, uh, then you could stop the spread. And so literally, whereas the, um, the infection was identified, at least publicized uh, in March of 2003, by uh, July of 2003, the uh, epidemic or outbreak was terminated because they were able to uh, quarantine people uh, who were sick and then stop transmission. Well, this is totally different now because we know, number one, that the, the contagiousness of this particular virus is much greater than SARS. It's even much greater than seasonal uh, influenza. And of course, like any novel infection, none of us uh, are immune to it, at least initially. We're all susceptible to it. And of course, uh, we know that some patients could become uh, quite ill um, and, and it can be associated with a mortality rate uh, as well. Uh, so I think I'm just going to uh, stop here, uh, Nicole, and uh, you know we can open it up to questions or other discussion. 
Sure, thank you very much. I mean, before we get to the questions, does, uh, Dr. Zarconi or Dr. Smith, do you have anything that you'd like to follow up with before we dive into those? So I'll, I'll, um, I'll make a few comments. So um, since this whole social distancing uh, era began and my wife and I uh, began to work exclusively from home for the past three weeks, the only thing that uh, we have argued about uh, is this uh, mask issue. Uh, and so far it hasn't tested our marriage, but uh, this business about do, do we experience benefit as a healthy person wearing a mask in public? And I think, uh, Angelo and Tom, you, you didn't help my arguments, but the, uh, um, I just, just want to make a couple of points about that. Um, the, uh, there's always, for a long time, there's been data that, uh, that has demonstrated that there doesn't appear to be benefit uh, for a healthy person wearing a mask in public in terms of the risk of contracting uh, other coronavirus infections. Um, and uh, the the more recent science that uh, Dr. Delusha talked about uh, is, I think, helpful, but, but we could argue incomplete uh, because what's being looked at is uh, how does it work as a barrier, but what's not being looked at yet and needs to be looked at is how does it work as, an in as a uh, potential mechanism to increase risk? Because there is evidence that uh, wearing a mask draws the hands to the face much more frequently uh, and uh, may also reduce the vigilance, as Dr. Files suggested, uh, that that person has because of creating a false sense of security, may reduce the diligence of that individual uh, with regular hand washing and uh, social distancing and other uh, techniques of importance. And, it, you know, it's interesting that there was a, um, when I learned that SUMA and, and actually Cleveland Clinic Akron General now are, are having everybody in the hospital wear masks, I, 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 discovered that there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine that came from the public health experts at Harvard. Uh, and, and it was called uh, Universal Masking in Hospitals in the COVID-19 Era. And, I, and when I saw that uh, title that it appeared in the New England Journal, I presumed that that might have been what, it was a sort of hot off the press discussion. I, I thought that might have been what informed uh, our local hospitals to make this decision. But it's interesting that these uh, public health experts continue to make the point that we know that wearing a mask outside of healthcare facilities really offers little, if any, protection and impact may increase the risk of uh, transmission. And they also cite that uh, there's evidence that what is defined as significant exposure to COVID-19 as face-to-face -face contact within six feet of a patient with symptomatic COVID-19 that is sustained for at least a few minutes, and some say maybe as long as 10, and some say maybe as long as 30 minutes, uh, the chance of catching COVID-19, they point out, in a passing interaction in a public space is still considered to be pretty minimal. Um, but I think Dr. File made a really important point, too, is that the mask does serve other functions other than to reduce, if it does, the transmission of disease to healthy persons. And clearly, the mask as a symbol uh, might inspire confidence of the people around uh, uh, the mask-wearing individual uh, and uh, also the mask as a reminder of this uh, always invisible invader uh, that's around us that, that puts us at risk. But I think one of, the, one of the maybe most important benefits is what they described in this article when they wrote expanding masking protocols greatest contribution may be to reduce the transmission of anxiety over and over, above whatever role they may play in reducing the transmission of COVID. 19. It's, it, it seems to me that the more recent recommendations that came from the CDC uh, have, are much more, uh, they're using words like uh, might, bene might be beneficial, probably a good idea, uh, what, because I think the science still is early uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Uh, interestingly, the World Health Organization's position remains the same, that they, they do not believe uh, that it is of any value to wear masks in public. And they, uh, they go on to say that if, in fact, uh, you are going to recommend wearing masks, you should uh, do that while evaluating not just the reason why the mask is being wear, but what is the real risk of exposure and what is the vulnerability of the mask wearing person. Because clearly those would influence that. If, if you have you know, a number of underlying diseases and you're out in public, uh, I would think that you would uh, be someone that might experience more benefit wearing a mask in public than a healthy person. 
So uh, I think this, uh, the debate about wearing a mask in, in public uh, spaces, I think continues. It's about the only place where debate remains. Clearly wearing a, uh, putting a mask on an infected person uh, is beneficial and clearly for healthcare providers to wear uh, N95 masks is beneficial. Yeah, but uh, Joe, I, I would argue that uh, you're, you're, you're potentially stigmatizing the individual that has to wear the mask. And so therefore, there is, uh, despite the, uh, the, the Harvard epidemiological evidence is what they're really basing their work on, there is scientific um, uh, evidence that suggests that there's more to it than just simply saying it's ineffective. The real crux of the matter is that much of that saying it's ineffective comes from the fact that we don't know uh, one way or the other, but there is, um, there is now some evidence building that suggests, for example, um, there's evidence looking at a mask in, in terms of particle uh, retention and also particle uptake. And I, I have a table here that indicates that what Dr. File was talking about for example, just the surgical mask, if, you're, if you have 100 particles as your reference, uh, you only leak 50 particles um, uh, when you have a surgical mask, whereas you'd leak 100 particles if you didn't have the mask. That two-fold difference, we don't know. In biology, oftentimes, bio two-fold differences you know, aren't very necessarily significant, but it could, in fact, um, uh, be part of the reason for why one would argue that, hey, if you just have a surgical mask, why not? Okay, because you're, de you're definitely trying to lower the R not re uh, number. And anything that we can do besides, in addition to social distancing, can in fact reduce that number in a faster manner, a kinetically uh, uh, measurable manner. I think that it's, it's valuable to really look at and not, not necessarily um, suggest that there's no benefit. The other thing is, if we look in Asian societies, where the mask is sort of like a common um, uh, thing in even influenza season or whatever, uh, some of those, some of that, some of that data, it's epidemiological data, which is not as good as the data that I would like, which is okay. So, how many particles is a person passing? And here's um, um, before I run off on a tangent, those societies do seem to have some. Uh, possible benefit. Now, we're only going to, it's going to take us a longer time to figure this out in this pandemic. But here's part of the problem is that we don't know the bolus of virus necessary in a droplet. Um, and actually, even the size of the droplet is it aerosols. We're still debating aerosols versus droplets. And those, that uh, biological phenomenon is really critical for knowing how effective uh, you are being so close or not so close because droplets fall at a particular distance versus aerosols. And um, this is part of the mask issue also is that in fact, we, uh, I think that there is valuable scientific biological data that indicates that masks and also behavioral uh, evidence that suggests that if we're not going to try to stigmatize people that ha have the disease and and uh, and leave them out there as uh, 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 people that you know have to wear the mask, I think that there's uh, plenty of uh, evidence to uh, suggest that masks in public during this time uh, could be uh, could be quite valuable on on both levels, biological and also socio behavioral. Well, listen, uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't disagree with anything you said, Angelo, the, and I would only suggest that we also need to understand more fully the, the risks associated with wearing masks to the extent that it, uh, how it brings the hands to the face, how it might reduce our vigilance and other, uh, and other techniques. And all okay, Joe, things. so I here's the thing. Disagree. They did a study. It's very small. They took 26 medical students and they observed them for uh, you know, a number of hours. And they touched the, the typical medical student touched their face 23 times per hour. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of data. It's not like that, that great because the number is small, but it shows you that we as human beings touch our face quite a bit anyway. And so the fact that you have a mask or whatever, it's not, I don't know these circumstances. Are you going to touch your face more or not? And I think that people could be um, trained for certainly health professionals are trained, not only to put this mask on properly, but also, um, as Dr. File was saying, you know, don't try to touch your eyes or something like that, because that's another portal of entry. But um, I think that, that even the public 
could be uh, could work on not touching their face, for example, if they're wearing a mask. Yeah, actually, um, I, I, you know, trying to look at the science, and I think the science is a bit limited, and I think both of you said that, but uh, at least from the clinical standpoint, maybe not so much from the physical particle size standpoint, because I know there's been lots of studies looking at how, uh, how you filter air with these different barriers or different masks. But I, I, I saw one study last night, and it was another study of healthcare providers, wasn't necessarily medical students, but it was a, a, a trial, it was a cluster, randomized cluster trial. So, you know, a whole group of uh, the healthcare providers would wear the mask and the other groups would not. And it was during an influenza season. And they just wanted to see if there would be reduced influenza. Well, the intent to treat results no difference. Why? Because the group that wore the masks, they didn't wear the masks. I mean, because they measured compliance and, you know, uh, at least uh, half of the, uh, the people that were supposed to wear a mask, they felt it was uncomfortable. I don't know, you know, I can tell you, I mean, like the one you have there, uh, uh, um, Angelo, that goes around your ears, right? Okay, some of the, like me, if I wear that type of mask, that N95 mask, after about 10 minutes, my, my ears are hurting me. Uh, so that's why I, I uh, wear the other one. But, but nevertheless, um, but when they looked at the, um, that study, the results, instead of intent to treat, and they looked at the um, results based on those healthcare providers who were uh, um, compliant with wearing the mask, there was a difference in uh, reducing influenza. And then I also found um, a meta-analysis that was just published last week. It's still uh, uh, pre-print um, by a very uh, reputable group uh, in um, McMaster University where they do all this grade meta-analysis type stuff and Cochrane reviews. And uh, the title was Masks for Preventing COVID-19 in Healthcare Providers, a Meta-Analysis. Um, and they do a very, very critical analysis of, of the evidence. And they came to the conclusion, I'm just gonna read it here, that there's low certainty of evidence that suggests that medical masks and N95s offers protection against viral respiratory infection, including coronavirus in healthcare workers during, and this is critical here, during non-aerosol generating care. So, you know, and it gets to the, another, I guess, controversy that you brought up, Angelo. I mean, that is, I mean, we've all been saying this is air droplet, but maybe there is a form of airborne uh, spread. We don't think it's airborne like tuberculosis is, or like measles is, where, I mean, I could be in the same room 50 feet away from a person and be at risk. But it may be airborne so that, uh, you know, I could be five or six feet away and Nobody's coughing, but yet when I'm talking, I may be generating this airborne uh, transmission as well. But I want to go back to you, Joe, and that is this. You said that you and your wife were, and, and I, maybe I was misinterpreting it, where it was having a debate. So I assume from what you said, you were sort of against masks. Was Debbie in favor of masks? And if that's the case, I am in her camp. Uh, thank you for that. I uh, I would also point out that uh, my wife would be quick to point out that the that the opinions of the public health experts uh, at Harvard that was published in the New England Journal uh, that piece was actually published on April first. Um, so she, I'm sure she'd be quick to point out that uh, the, the potential problems with that publication date. Uh, I, I and just to clarify, I don't take a position against masks. I'm only I'm only uh, wanting to be clear that uh, not everything we do is uh, fully evidence-based, but I think to Angelo's point, uh, which is a very good point, um, and, and my wife's argument is if in fact there's potential benefit, why not? So well, on that note, you guys have been talking about a number of things that are in the questions, um, I, and I'd like to get make sure that we've reserved some time for questions. So Dr. File, do you want to respond really quick to, to Dr. Zarconi or? No, no, no. I mean, uh, and I, actually, uh, Joe, I think I'm going to be in your camp on this point, because when you say, if there's potential, then why not? We have to be careful about that. We still have to rely on science. And, and, and I will admit that the science is somewhat limited. We need clinical outcomes, not just this physiologic uh, air particle type of uh, 
outcomes. But, um, you know, well, to your point, well, Tom, well, th this is a big issue when we talk about all these medical interventions that are ongoing right now. I mean, we've heard in the media about, you know, quote, the malaria drug, right? Yeah. Well, I can tell you the evidence is very, very minimal. And I'm aware of um, very stringent meta-analysis that are just going to be coming out, which suggest, based on the evidence, there is no evidence of efficacy. So we have to be careful about saying, right. well, what is the, uh, if there's potentially benefit, what's, what do we have to lose? Well, there's a lots of side effects. I can tell you about a third of the patients, well, maybe not that high, but, but these 25% of the patients that um, we want to consider using this drug, hydroxychloroquine, which is all over the news, um, we find significant contra, uh, contraindications to, and that if we were to put them on, we would probably cause more harm than good. So we just have to be careful. I mean, there are randomized clinical trials. We're going to know on the evidence pretty shortly, but we just have to be careful about this concept about, well, if it, because this word potential is very important. That does, because you say potentially beneficial, that doesn't mean it is. Um, and there's always potential harm. So whenever we're doing anything, and you know this, Joe, I mean, we're always uh, considering the benefits of the, or the risks of any intervention that we uh, do with patients. That was beautifully stated and a critically important point. Thank you for that. Thank you to all of you. Um, I'm gonna try to condense some questions because some are kind of similar. Um, but one is with, uh, if we're trying to protect N95 for, for hospital usage and for healthcare frontline worker usage, is it better to wear the surgical mask or a cloth mask? And do you think that the CDC waited so long to make the recommendation because of the shortage of personal protective equipment? Uh, yeah. I can say something about the shortage. That's, uh, there are a number of, uh, Battelle has a, uh, a process that actually um, can sterilize N95 masks in quite, quite a large number. And up to 20 times, I think the the, the system is uh, so. And then I, I've just seen in California, they've been able to acquire some uh, uh, larger amounts of various masks or whatever than ever. So I think some of these uh, shortages will will be um, uh, taken care of. But I still I still am concerned about it make sure, making sure that the uh, um, protective mask and the N95 mask is, is available for frontline healthcare professionals. Uh, so in, uh, until we have enough supply, I certainly wouldn't argue for their use out in the public. Although I do argue for the use of, of uh, surgical mask material, materials like that as being beneficial uh, from this very, uh, as, as Dr. Fial mentioned, and also Dr. Gisarconi has mentioned that in this very uh, in indefinite in or um, inconclusive uh, analysis, um, it's it, it's a it's um, difficult to to make a, a definitive conclusion, but still, yet I'm hopeful. Yeah, I just want to uh, follow up, and uh, Dr. Drusha makes a good point. I forgot to mention this, but he did now, and that is, you know, these N95 masks. I don't know if you can see it uh, inside. I've got my name on it because we reuse these. Uh, after I use it for a day, uh, we turn it into a, a central area and then it, it's uh, resanitized or sterilized, either using ultraviolet light or a fogger with uh, hydrogen peroxide. There's actually uh, various other forms of, of uh, re-sterilization. And like Angela said, I mean, it, it appears to be safe to do this up to about 20 times. And this is one way that we can save our protective equipment, our personal protective equipment. So that's what we do with these. Now with the, uh, the surgical masks, uh, we, we have to throw away after we've used them. But these, the cloth masks, we take home and you wash them. You just put them in the regular washer, the detergent, and that gets rid of the virus. And so we can, can, can <laughs> continuously reuse those, reuse those as well. Now, the question about the CDC, I really think, uh, and Joe's right about this, I mean, the, the, they did, probably were very hesitant because we didn't have the science, uh, and the recommendation was always that it really didn't protect the wearer, and you're worried about the, uh, the, 
the negative consequences of you know uh, false security, maybe not adhering to uh, social distancing and hand washing, et cetera, which is very, very important and much more important than wearing a mask. But, uh, but I think what sort of convinced them was uh, when they became aware of the fact that there's this asymptomatic shedding, that you know, maybe if everybody wears it, they can reduce the asymptomatic shedding. Plus, there's some sort of observational information from Singapore, where Singapore did this. And I don't know if you recall, but um, Singapore really has much less burden of disease uh, than uh, certainly China. Um, or at least central China, not necessarily Hong Kong, but, uh, and it's really interesting because Singapore just recently started to, to reduce their mitigation policies, and now they're starting to see a, a spike again. And so, uh, of course, it's, it's a lot more than just masks, but part of their um, policy was that people, when they would go out into public, would wear masks, in addition to all of the social distancing. Uh, I don't know if they reduced schools or reduced non-essential businesses like we've done here. And by the way, I think we're in Ohio are pretty lucky because I think our uh, governor and Ohio Department of Director actually was very proactive. And, and we were one of the first states that really had a comprehensive mitigation policy where they closed schools, closed non-essential um, businesses, reduced gatherings. Uh, and uh, I think we're paying benefits now because we're certainly not as bad as some of our neighboring states. And yeah, I would, I would just Dr. Uh, Dr. Drake over at Ohio State also for really uh, uh, essentially shutting down Ohio State very fairly early on, and everybody else then recognized the significance after he did that. So I, I agree with doc, uh, Dr. File that the um, uh, governor and Amy Acton have been really very great for the state and. Um, uh, but uh, House State President, and then the other presidents, of course, realizing how how significant a, a, a decision that was, uh, I think, has been uh, very fortunate and, and favorable for our leader. And I was just going to add one comment about the uh, the use of masks uh, by the public, because N95 masks can actually be purchased by any of us, and and I and we're hearing more stories about uh, individuals and families who have. Uh, who have stocked up on N95 masks for their own personal use uh, to go out in public and what have you. And I think, while I don't mean to be critical of other people's decision making, I do encourage us all to consider the ethical uh, issues around the uh, consumption of N95 masks. I have a son in DC who purchased something from Amazon and when he got his item, there were two items in the box. One was his item and the other was a mistakenly placed 20 count box of N95 masks. She called me and was like, this is great. I'm just going to hold on to these. I might need them. And I said, you really need to do whatever you can to get those into the hands of, of healthcare providers. So I, I would certainly encourage all of us to think about not uh, consuming that resource. But much uh, to what my colleagues just said, the, the curves in Ohio do look better. And in the regional uh, hospital and health system CEO conversations, uh, there's more, we're hearing more and more that they're uh, fine with PPE at the moment and don't anticipate having a problem, but uh, that's certainly not the case everywhere in Ohio, and it's definitely not the case everywhere in the country. So uh, I think we should certainly be taking a hands-off approach to those particular uh, devices. Oh, and by the way, uh, yesterday there was a really, uh, pertinent to what Dr. Fowl said, there was a really interesting article uh, published in the Washington Post, and we'll be happy to share the link. I can send uh, the link to that was published in the Washington Post that actually describes uh, the Ohio experience. And it's quite uh, laudatory uh, with respect to uh, the leadership in Ohio. Thank you, sir. Another couple combined questions. Um, one would be how often should masks be changed? And, and I'm thinking specifically about the cloth mask and how often should that be washed? Because you really address the other, what, you know, how often with the other masks. And are there instances when surgical masks, uh, not, not N95, but a surgical mask would be insufficient for direct care staff working on a COVID unit? I mean, it sounds like you've said that yeah. if you were working in the hospital, N95 is really what you need, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Every one of our healthcare providers who is gonna have any potential exposure with a patient, I mean, it could be a nurse, could be a physical therapist, 
could, you know, anybody, they're, they are given the N95 masks. And, and like I said, they can wear them for that day, then they turn them in and they get another one. Then the following day, they could get it back if they have their name on it and their employee number, which I don't have on mine actually on this one. But, um, but as far as uh, these, the, the cloth masks, they can wear this all. But remember, we're wearing this, not with, with, with patient contact at all. This is just like we're walking in the hall, we're wa walking uh, in the elevator or whatever. Again, we, ha we have this one on. Uh, and this we take home and we wash it every night with detergent and water. So that's how we do with that. With the, uh, the, the um, surgical mask, once you use it and take it off, you got to throw it away. It's the, because it gets moist and it, it just doesn't, it's not effective after that. So as a follow-up to that, is there anything that you could recommend for those people who are living with somebody who works in the healthcare system? So maybe you're a family member of somebody who works in a hospital. What are the steps that the family should be taking to protect themselves from spreading any possible contagion? Well, wash hands. Uh, if anybody gets sick, then you have to separate. But we're not recommending that if, if people are healthy that you have to separate. But the most important thing uh, is hand washing and then disinfecting common uh, objects. I mean, here's my phone, right? I don't know if you can see it, but you know, I, I, only I use it, but sometimes my secretary or the office staff comes in and use it. So every time we use it, if somebody else has been using it, we've got these things on all of our desks, okay? So we, we wipe them down. Uh, we wipe down our keyboards, or, and uh, so that's extremely important. That's what you should do at home. Thank you. And just for those people that start to log off a little bit early, just to remind you that we do record these sessions, and within a couple of days, they'll be posted on Neomed's Project Echo webpage. <laughs> um, so you will have access to all of this material. And please do fill out the survey to give us feedback on this and sign up for your continuing education. A couple of additional questions before we wrap up is one of them, how long, if you're a carrier, how long do you carry it for? So how long should you, if you know that you're carrying it, should you be taking extra precautions or? Well, all we know is from patients who have been followed and then have become sick. And, and basically the best data comes from those patients who were uh, quarantined when they came from Wuhan into the United States early in January, and they were put in uh, to some of the military bases, and then they were monitored daily, and they were tested, and uh, those that became positive um, and then became ill, they were tested until they uh, resolved their illness. And I, I, from, from what I correct, from what I remember, most of them after 10 days, they stopped shedding, but there's always a few an outliers that have gone out to be positive for 20 to 29 to 30 days. But that's usually in patients who have <clears throat> maybe underlying conditions or cancer or, or some immune uh, deficiency. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, what we don't know, and this is really important, and we have to get this data, uh, are the asymptomatic shedders, how long they could be shedding. And so we really don't know that. And related to that, do we know why this virus is so contagious and why it's so terrible in some and so asymptomatic in others? That's a great question. I mean, as we see these patients, because we've been seeing them now for the last two and a half weeks and they're gradually increasing, um, we're monitoring certain um, what we call biomarkers or inflammatory markers that uh, sort of tell us, because we know that 80, 85% of the patients they're, they have mild disease. So can we, pre, can we predict which patients are gonna have more serious disease? Well, we do know that the older you are and uh, more significant underlying condition, immunocompromising condition, uh, and that you're more likely to have more serious disease. But even of those patients, can we predict, and we really can't accept that what we do, we follow some of these biomarkers like a C-reactive protein, like a ferritin, like a LDH. Uh, there are markers of uh, cytokines like IL-6 that when we start seeing that go up, that really predicts that they're going to uh, develop the significant complications. And those are the patients that we really want to follow. I guess the other thing is the oxygenation. We've actually 
in patients who we see who aren't that sick and aren't going to come in the hospital, we're thinking about giving them uh, pulse oximeters. Now, these are little devices you put on your finger or whatever, and they measure the oxygen level because we know that if they're fairly stable, um, that's good. But we always tell them if you get worse symptoms, more shortness of breath, more cough, more fever, you got to come back or call your primary care physician. But a good parameter would be to follow their oxygen levels because if you have pneumonia, and that's what we're really concerned about with this, what really is best to follow is the level of oxygenation. And if they're measuring their oxygen and all of a sudden one day it's starting to go down, that's going to be a signal that we're very concerned that this is going to potentially be associated with a complication for which they need to be evaluated and, and possibly uh, hospitalized. So I have a, a, an interesting, complicated question that was put into the chat box. Um, well, then Dr. Zarconi is going to answer that. So this is coming from one of our medical students. Um, it says, well, while we're gaining benefits against the coronavirus, and that's great, have we been looking at the negative side effects of the stay-at-home order, such as diet, um, drinking, drug use, uh, loss of homes, and particularly for those in poorer housing, things that prove to be harmful for people in the long run? I will, I will uh, start uh, responding to this. I think uh, we're still pretty early in this uh, life change that we're all experiencing, but there already is emerging, there are already emerging data uh, to demonstrate or to suggest a significant increase in domestic violence, which I think is a, is a real concern. And, uh, and, and to make that concern worse, victims of domestic violence are less likely to seek um, attention, either the attention of law enforcement or the attention of uh, healthcare givers. And so uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, they're, they're left to be untreated in some, uh, in some ways. There has been uh, there has been some speculation that um, uh, divorce rates uh, we may see a rise in divorce rates and certainly uh, there there's also some speculation that we'll see an increase in uh, birth rates um, and uh, as I told my young son and daughter-in-law in California the bad news for them would be if they experienced both of those at the same time uh, so but there there uh, there's also a, a fair bit of attention being paid to the mental health implications uh, of both our isolation uh, from one another uh, and our separation from the workplaces uh, and our, uh, you know, our uh, just the, the general anxiety related to uh, what a, appears to be a pretty severe illness uh, that's sort of looming out there, uh, and also anxiety uh, about being unable to care for uh, you know, elderly loved ones. Uh, many of us have elderly parents that, that uh, are completely, we're completely isolated from and can no longer really uh, oversee their wellness. And so there, I think there's a, there are going to be a lot of um, evidence that uh, this time that we're spending with social isolation will have had a lot of uh, negative consequences. Those are a few that I think are mostly being talked about uh, currently. Thank you, Dr. Zarconi. Um, Dr. Smith, do you want to chime in and, and say anything on that note? Actually, I thought uh, Dr. Zarconi covered that quite nicely. They're in the uh, psychiatric list serves. Uh, I'm on one, you know, a couple of them nationally, and one in Maryland where I trained as well. And, you know, there's a lot of concern about the potential after effect of this, that a lot of people may be kind of just white knuckling it as it were uh, right now in place, unable to really get that social connection. We are social animals. Uh, we often spend our hours forgetting that we're animals and also for, forgetting that we're social animals. So it may be that we'll see a, a surge of need for mental health care uh, that will come up as really as soon as the, these uh, social, or I, I actually like Dr. Zarconi's physical distancing, uh, measures are removed, I think we're better off than being ready for that uh, and hoping that uh, statewide that there's no, because of funding, no reason to cut those services at a time we might actually need them more. So that's that's the, the piece that's in the background going on to try to make sure that we're prepared. Thank you. And I think that this is a nice place to point out that because of all of these questions and the complexity of 
this issue and how many questions are in the chat box that we won't have time to get to based on respecting everybody's schedule for today. Um, we will share the questions in the chat box with our panelists and try to get all of those answered, at least in some type of a Word document or PDF so that those can be shared. Um, but Neomed is looking at whether or not or how we best address these ongoing concerns through our various ECHO programs, um, integrated care being one of those because it does really hit that interface of primary care and mental health and, and all of the, you know, bring, connecting the brain, the body back to the head. Um, I also wanna highlight real quick, just out of the respect for time, uh, Simon Robbins is our reference librarian at Neomed and he's been putting together, you know, there's a lot of resources shared in the chat box and a lot of resources that have been shared across the faculty, but he's taken some time to put together a section within the library guide um, to house a bunch of those resources. So Simon, if you're still on and wanna unmute, just letting people know about it for a minute and how to get there, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone, um, especially those who I haven't met. So I'm, I'm a reference librarian at Neomed, and I um, collaborate um, every week with the Icon Echo team, um, specifically in the area of literature searches, but also um, in helping to um, host some more online content for them. So I'm just going to put in the chat box. Um, I'm not going to share my screen. But if you go to this page, um, there's a couple of other pages two um, directly beside this page, but this one seems to be the most um, relevant for our discussion. Uh, as you might guess, I did specific searches on primary care and mental health and their relation to um, COVID-19. Um, I found about 30 results in the area of primary care um, and about 70 results, and these are peer-reviewed um, publications. I also put together some collections of news articles, but those are far more results as you might guess. Um, and then also there was, I already put it in the chat box, but there was some um, resources that were forwarded by Nicole that had to do with recent publications on masks and COVID. Um, so there's also a link on that page that I just put in the chat box. Um, specifically, there's a set of resources around masks and COVID-19. So um, please do some further reading if you're curious. I can tell by the chat box that most people are. Um, within those libraries, all, all these resources are freely available at the moment. So um, the scholarly community made them that way. So don't worry about having to find them really anywhere except for just Googling them. Simon, that's very helpful. Uh, and th uh, we all thank you for that. The, the other one that I didn't mention that I think is beginning to get attention among the healthcare uh, care professions is concern about patients with uh, chronic diseases who are choosing to not seek health care because they can either not get to see their doctors or don't want to uh, utilize emergency rooms or hospitals. I think that's another one that's probably going to have some, uh, some downside dimension to it. That's great to know. I can do a, a search on that as well and put up a link to some additional resources. So, great. Right, thank you. Thanks. So that I can contribute humor as I usually do. Hopefully you can now see my screen. Uh, <laughs> you have some of that in a They're mass good. discussion, so it's a little cultural humor with Van Gogh, so. Yeah. Well, we can use some humor now. <laughs> Definitely. I want to thank all of you again for taking the time today to contribute to this discussion, for sharing the resources, for being a support to one another, for all of you for joining, and for so many of your cameras being on. Um, like we talk about every week in the Integrated Care Echo, uh, Project Echo is all about community and we all need that more than ever right now. So thank you. Send in more ideas. Keep an eye on the websites while we figure out how to continue to address all of these issues. And stay healthy, safe, and go find something humorous or, you know, joyful to do with your day. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions also, everyone. So very, for, very interesting questions. Mm. Nicole. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.